Hello, everyone. This is the CircuitPython weekly meeting for May the 16th. Uh, this is the time of the week where we're going to get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. Uh, my name is Tim, and I am sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. CircuitPython is a version of Python that is designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. Uh, the development for CircuitPython is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support them and the CircuitPython project, consider purchasing hardware from Adafruit.com. This meeting gets hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython dev text channel as well as the CircuitPython voice channel. This meeting typically happens Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 11 a.m. Pacific Time, except when that coincides with a U.S. holiday. Uh, in the notes doc, there is a link to a calendar that you can view online or add to your favorite calendar app, uh, and we will also send notifications about the upcoming meetings in the Discord. If you would like to get those notifications, you can ask to be added to that CircuitPythonistas role on the Discord there. Uh, there's a notes doc to accompany the meeting and the recording. The notes document contain, contains timestamps that go along with the meeting. Oh, I forgot to start my timestamper. Just realized. Uh, so we'll be a couple of seconds behind, about a minute and a half behind. I'll try to adjust those afterwards. Um, let's see, sorry about that. Uh, get back to where we were here. Uh, the notes document contains timestamps to go along with the video, so you can use the doc to view the parts of the video that interest you most. The meeting tends to run about 60 to 90 minutes, uh, depending on how many folks we have for our round robin sections. Um, so this gives you an option to skip around um, if you are watching the meeting after the fact or listening to a podcast. You can uh, check out those timestamps to find the sections that you are most interested in. Um, the notes document is uh, pinned in the CircuitPython dev channel. If you click the little uh, pinned message thing up at near the top right inside Discord, you will see a link to that uh, notes doc. Uh, and that gets updated each week, so you can always um, hit that link earlier in the week in order to add your notes for the upcoming meeting as well. Um, so this meeting is going to be held in five parts. The first part will be community news. This is a look at all things CircuitPython as well as Python on hardware. Uh, this is a preview of the Python on microcontrollers newsletter, which comes out on Tuesdays. The second part will be the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. This is going to be a statistical overview of the entire project. It's a chance to look at the project by the numbers, separate from what we are all working on individually. Uh, the third part is going to be hug reports. This is the first of our two round robins. This is an opportunity to highlight the good things that uh, folks in the community are doing. Take time to recognize awesome folks in our community. Uh, the fourth part is status updates. Status updates is the second of our two round robins. This is an opportunity to sync up on what you've been up to since the last meeting, as well as uh, take a minute to talk about what you will be working on until the next meeting. Um, the fifth and final part is called In the Weeds. Uh, In the Weeds is an opportunity for more long-form discussions. These discussions can come out of status updates or they can be identified ahead of time as topics that are likely going to be too long for status updates, so they can go down in the weeds. Uh, and again, that is down at the bottom of the notes doc. If you have any topics that you'd like to add, you can add those anytime throughout the meeting at the bottom. Uh, all right, and that covers how the meeting will go. Uh, so next up, we will take a look at the community news for this week. Uh, so this week in community news, we have uh, the Raspberry Pi Pico learning path. Uh, thanks to our brand new and free introduction to Raspberry Pi Pico learning path, young coders can easily join and make their own cool Pico projects. This free learning path has six guided projects to help kids to independently develop their coding skills and their skills in physical computing and electronics. And there is a link here to the Raspberry Pi blog to learn more about this. Um, next up, we have uh, PyCon US 2022 highlights. Uh, so some highlights uh, provided by Eric Mathis um, uh, wrote out their personal highlights from attending this year's PyCon. And there is a blog post linked in the notes doc for that as well. Uh, next up, uh, folks can provide uh, the Microbit Educational Foundation with your feedback. 
So the Microbit Educational Foundation, uh, Foundation recently released a beta version of the new Microbit Python editor, and they would like to hear about your experience using it. Um, they are most interested in uh, teachers uh, to help test and improve the Microbit Python editor by using it with your students and help shape the future of learning text-based coding with the, uh, with the creativity of physical computing. If you're a teacher and you are interested in teaching Python with the BBC Microbit, uh, we would welcome your feedback. So there is a short form where you can uh, fill out to apply to give uh, feedback for that study. Uh, being done by the Microbit Educational Foundation. A uh, couple of uh, projects to highlight uh, in the community news this week. There is uh, by, let's see, our very own Toddbot posted on Twitter uh, a, uh, a link and a GIF and some other information about this project, which is uh, dual screens, uh, two GC9A01 round TFT uh, LCD displays being driven by a Raspberry Pi Pico. Um, the whole thing is battery powered using the Adafruit Cutie Pie uh, BFF. Um, so take a look at that and there's a link to the Twitter thread in the notes. Um, and then uh, rounding out community news this week, we have a smart cooler monitor using the Circuit Playground Express and Circuit Python. So uh, this was a video uh, released on YouTube. I believe it was the uh, Toronto uh, Toronto Makerspace, um, something like that. They posted this video, and it's a person who is going over the uh, the coding for a smart monitor that will live inside of a cooler. So it. Uh, tells you what the temperature in the cooler is like and whether it's gotten too hot, um, you know, maybe if it got left open or something like that. So uh, take a look at that one. There's a blog uh, link for the Adafruit blog, and uh, I think the original source on that one is YouTube. Uh, all right, so all of these items have been a preview of the CircuitPython weekly newsletter, uh, which is a CircuitPython community-run newsletter emailed every Tuesday. The complete archives are uh, can be found on adafruitdaily.com. Again, there's a link for that in the notes. Uh, and it highlights the latest Python on hardware-related news from around the web, including CircuitPython, uh, regular you know, CPython uh, for desktop computers, as well as MicroPython developments. To contribute your own projects uh, or news, you can edit next week's draft on GitHub. There's a link for that in the notes doc. Uh, you can submit a pull request with your changes. Um, you can also tag a tweet with hashtag CircuitPython on Twitter or email to cpnews at adafruit.com if you would like to submit ideas for the newsletter. All right, so that gets us up to the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka. Uh, so let's see here. Uh, this is a statistical overview of the entire project by the numbers. It gives us a chance to look at the health of the project separate from what we're all working on. We'll talk about the project overall and then separately discuss the core, the libraries, excuse me, and Blinka. So first up will be the overall stats for this week and I will read those. Let's get a timestamp here. Uh, so overall this week we had 37 pull requests merged. Uh, by 24 authors, which is great to see. Um, I didn't highlight these ahead of time, but I'll run through real quick. And the names that uh, I don't recognize as regular contributors, I think are, let's see, J, uh, JC Rise, JCE Rise, uh, Ryan S. Keith, KT Kinsey 37, um, let's see, Dav Clark, uh, WTU Mura, um, Matt Land, Big Tuna 94, uh, Simon Vale, WLCX, uh, WAI, WENG 83. Um, those look like the folks that are new, at least to me. So thank you to all those folks, as well as all of our authors uh, across everything this week. Uh, we had seven reviewers. So thank you to all of our reviewers. Of course, the more uh, folks that we can get reviewing, the more authors that we can support overall. So definitely thank you to all of those folks. Uh, in terms of issues, we had 30 closed issues this week by nine people uh, with 23 opened by 17 people. So we are net down a couple of issues this week, which is great to see. Um, and that wraps up overall. So next I will uh, take a timestamp and pass it over to Scott to tell us about the core. Hello, thank you, Tim. 
Uh, so for the core, we had 21 pull requests merged from 15 different authors, which is awesome and amazing since I've been out. Uh, some new names for me on here are Simon Vale, um, WLCX, Y Wing 83, Big Tuna 94, all new names to me. So thank you to those folks. We had four reviewers for those uh, 21 pull requests, so thank you to them as well. We have 13 open poll requests. Uh, we have two that are over 200 days old, so those are the ones that we should take a look at. I know last week I think Dan mentioned that some of these are waiting for 8.0, um, which maybe we're getting close to. We could talk about that later. Um, but yeah, we have 13 open poll requests, generally um, kind of even. So we'll keep an eye on those. Hey, Issues-wise, we had 19 closed issues by four people and eight open by seven, so we're net down 11, which is awesome. Uh, for a total of 511 open issues. Uh, we use milestones to track kind of where we're at um, in terms of uh, triage and things. So we have, um, <laughs> this number is definitely not right, minus five issues not inside of a milestone, but that's always a good category to take a look at to see what we've got, um, what we've got uh, to triage that we haven't triaged yet. Um, we have zero open issues, both for the 7.2x and 7.3.0, which is very exciting, and thanks to Dan for that hard work. Um, and then we have 35 issues for 7.xx, so I think that um, maybe we should in the weeds it, but maybe it's time to get 7.3.0 official and then we'll um, er, officially stable, and then we could switch over to an 8.0. Um, it might be time to do 8.0, we'll see. Uh, okay, and that's it for the core stats. Alrighty, thank you, Scott. Uh, next up, I will send it over to Katni to tell us about the libraries. Thanks, Tim. This section applies to all of the Adafruit CircuitPython libraries, which is everything that starts with Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore, and a couple of extras like the bundles and our cookie cutter. So over the last week, we've had 14 pull requests merged by nine different authors. Uh, a number of the new names that Tim mentioned earlier are on this list as well. So thanks to everybody who is a recent, uh, recent contributor. Um, and we had six reviewers. Um, we had, so that leaves us with 30 open pull requests. And in terms of issues, we had 11 issues closed by six people and 15 open by 12 people. So we're up a little bit. Uh, leaving us with 644 open issues. 191 of those are good first issues. If you are interested in contributing to CircuitPython on the Python side of things, check out circuitpython.org slash contributing. You'll find all this information and more, including open pull requests, open issues, and some library infrastructure uh, issues list. Um, you can, uh, if you're interested in reviewing, you can take a look at the open PRs, let us know that you took a look. Uh, if you have the hardware, test it. If you don't, uh, look at it for syntax, it's spelling, etc., and leave a comment. If you are looking for uh, to contribute code or documentation, check out the open issues. And if you're new to everything, Good First Issue is a great place to start. We also have a guide on contributing to CircuitPython using Git and GitHub, and uh, we are always available on Discord to help out as well. Um, so don't let uh, feeling new. Uh, intimidate you. We we can make sure that you are able to contribute in a way that works for you. In terms of library updates in the last seven days, we had one new library, Adafruit Circuit Python Floppy. Thank you to Jeff for that. And a number of updated libraries, uh, which I will not read off, but they are available in the um, in the notes. Uh, overall, it would say that I want to call out TechTrick, uh, which I will do again in Hug Reports. Uh, for running a patch over the weekend um, to get a couple things that were sort of crucial to, you know, the libraries um, the get the code updated and uh, updated our cookie cutter as well to be the latest code so that any new libraries coming out have the proper um, updates to them. And so I wanted to say thank you very much for that. And that's what I've got. Excellent. Thank you, Katni. Uh, and rounding out our um, state of circuit Python, let's pass it over to Melissa to tell us about Blinka. Hello, um, Blinka is our circuit Python compatibility layer for MicroPython, Raspberry Pi, and other single board computers. And this uh, week we had two pull requests merged by two authors and three reviewers. 
There are currently six open pull requests amongst all the repositories, and there were zero closed issues by zero people and zero open by zero people, uh, leaving a net of 77 open issues. There were 9,511 PyWheels downloads in the last month, and we are currently supporting 88 boards. And that's it. All right. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, so next up will be the first of our round robins. This will be the hug report section. And again, this is a chance to highlight folks in the CircuitPython community and beyond for doing awesome things. Uh, this section will be held as a round robin where I will start and then we'll go down the list alphabetically uh, as names appear in the notes document. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, if you are text only uh, or um, not present for the meeting, uh, when we get to your notes, then I'll read yours off. Otherwise, I will uh, pass it off to you to read your own notes for that section. Um, so getting us started, uh, my hard reports this week. Um, first one for uh, community member Paul SK for trying out the new tab layout, as well as uh, working through the process to make a PR to share a uh, more advanced example with um, some I2C sensors and some hot plug capability that will recognize when you plug and unplug them. Uh, so thank you to Paul for working through PyLint and all the other pre-commit checks and things to get a PR uh, put in for that. Um, next up, thank you to Nirdoc who shared a trove of uh, permissively licensed font files from a different project. It's always great to find a bunch of different fonts that we can utilize in CircuitPython projects. So thank you, Nerdoc, for finding and sharing that. Um, user AIOUE on uh, Discord, I think that's the username from Dis Discord, maybe GitHub, I could be wrong, I'm not sure. Um, they posted steps uh, in a PR that uh, other people could use to kind of follow, um, you know, follow through those steps to learn how to test out a PR. It's something um, that maybe we take for granted a little bit, like uh, testing um, different changes that are in a PR. Um, but this person wrote out some nice, easy to follow steps um, that somebody may find in the future and get benefit from. So thank you to them. Um, thank you to Dan for making the new uh, CircuitPython beta release recently. Uh, and then I also have the last hug report here uh, for PT and Lady Ada for showing some neat geodes and other minerals uh, and things last night on the desk of Lady Ada. It was fascinating to see uh, some of the different ones. Um, and I will also add one more that I didn't put in. Thank you to uh, Paul Cutler for uh, putting the links um, during the community news section in the chat. Uh, it's great to see folks doing that. Um, so next up for Hug Reports is uh, Dan H. OK, thank you. Um, so uh, thanks to Scott, who uh, returned. And then we had a, a, a good video talk about catching up and what are our priorities going forward. Um, and also, uh, Scott also did some immediate bug fixes for uh, BLE uh, auto reload stuff. Thank you very much. Um, thanks to Naradoc for two things, for adding frozen module listings to circuitpython.org and also in read the doc. So each board now lists which um, frozen modules it contains. That's really helpful. Uh, also for noticing just a few minutes ago, we were having trouble with monster mask boards and it appears that there may be a different flash chip on some builds of these boards. And Naradoc noticed that we were only supporting one of the chips, not both. Um, thanks to Tectric for making all kinds of documentation improvements, uh, linking to guides and stuff like that. This is really helpful because right now, in the past, read the docs and uh, the guides have kind of lived in separate worlds, and it's nice to have them cross-linked now. And welcome back to TG Techie, who is away, I think, maybe doing school stuff, and is coming back and is has, as before, is pushing the boundaries on trying to do things in the core language that um, are unusual and useful. Okay. All righty. Thanks, Dan. Uh, and Jeff is out this week, so I will read uh, his hug report. Uh, Jeff has a hug report for Katni. Thanks for helping add a library to the bundle and knowing the cause and solution of the three problems encountered while uh, you were working with uh, him to do so. Uh, and then next up is Katni herself. Hello. So uh, reiterating uh, Hug Report to Tectric for applying the patches to the libraries and updating Cookie Cutter over the weekend. Um, Hug Report for Radomir, Scott, and Dan for helping me far more deeply understand MPy files. Um, Radomir had a very long conversation 
with me um explaining things i i understood the gist of empire files but i did not understand the details and um dan and scott jumped in at the end with with a couple more details and it was all very helpful as i'm writing a guide on library file types um next up tectric for helping me make a style decision on that guide uh to dan for rc0 and everyone i miss because i know i miss something and a group hug all right thanks kenny uh, next up is maker melissa i just wanted to give a group hug to everyone all right thanks melissa uh let's see next up is uh mark gambler um i see you are here mark do you want to read yours or i can read them for you looks like probably text only i think so um so mark uh, has a group hug this week for everybody um and then next up i will pass it over to paul cutler i'd like to give a hug report to todd bot for helping me with the request library this weekend uh he got me on the right path and i was able to finish my project so i'm very excited about that and then uh, a second hug for liz clark for being a guest on the on today's episode of the circuit python show all right excellent looking forward to that one uh so next up is tammy makes things uh who's not attending so i'll read theirs um, Katney, uh, hug report to Katney for a great chat last week. Uh, hug report to Foamy Guy, me for the deep dives and other live streams from which I always learn something. And a group hug to the community for being awesome. So that's great. Thank you to Tammy. And next up, I will pass it over to Scott. Hello. Um, hug report to Katney for all of the PyLeap testing and really helping uh, Trevor keep going on PyLeap. That's very exciting. Thank you, Katney. And then also thank you to Trevor for letting me know the reload issue and being patient with me as, <laughs> as I uh, worked through that. All right, thanks, Scott. Uh, next up is Tectric, who is text only today. Uh, so I will read theirs. Hug report first for Katni for helping me roll out uh, the bundle library patch for pre-commit files this weekend. Uh, zero botched patches that have been found at least. Um, thank you also again to Katni for offering to teach me how to use Adabot to you uh, for future patches this week. Um, thank you to Foamy Guy for helping review some PRs that I've been working on, as well as helping uh, move forward some of the ones from PyCon. Uh, and lastly, Tectric has a group hug. And next up and rounding out hug reports is TG Techie. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> Um, to start off hug reports, um, I have a specific hug for Katni for a very warm welcome minutes after I sent my first text in the channel. Um, and then for Jay Epler, um, and I believe that's Jeff, correct? Yep. And Dan for the uh, swift response to my PR, adding a little bit of documentation. Um, another hug for Dan for adding the from future import annotation support. That's fantastic. Um, and I believe, Scott, you added parallel display support in the like the parallel display class. Uh, but if that was not you, thanks to whoever did. Um, and a hug for the community because you continue to be so awesome. Thank you. All right, excellent. Thank you, TG Techie. And it's great to see you uh, back around. Uh, so that wraps up hug reports. So next up, we will go on to status updates. And uh, again, status updates is our time to sync up on what we're all doing. This section is also held as a round robin where I will go first and then we'll go through the list uh, alphabetically again as they appear in the notes document. Uh, so take a few minutes and talk about what you have been doing since the last meeting, uh, what you think you'll be doing until the next meeting. Um, this is also a good place to provide tips and tricks uh, relevant to what people are working on. If a uh, discussion does start to become too much, we can always move it down to in the weeds to continue it on uh, later. Uh, so I will start out the status updates. Let me get a timestamp here. Uh, so last week I did some hardware testing uh, for a couple of different PRs on uh, the EMC 2101 fan driver, as well as the RFM uh, 9X radios, uh, which are things that I have a little bit of experience with, but not a whole lot of like practical projects or anything. So it took me a bit to 
um, get wrapped back around how to get those hooked up and how they're expected to work and stuff. But it was a nice, uh, fun experience to do some more sort of nuts and bolts hardware uh, related things. I spend a lot of time working on screens, and so it is always fun to uh, get out into um, you know more analog sort of non-picture uh, world sometimes. Um, uh, let's see. I also tried out uh, Paul SK's uh, new tab layout example, which um, shows a bunch of different uh, data from sensors. Um, so that was really neat. Thanks again to Paul for sharing that. Um, I this week um, got started on at least writing the project code for a, a new version of the PyPortal interface. Um, there's a learn guide. I think it's called PyPortal user interface or something like that. Um, which I think was written probably back when Display.io was brand new. Uh, it's a great, um, great learn guide that I have referenced many, many times. Um, but we do have some newer features in Display.io that make it uh, hopefully easier to write that sort of uh, project nowadays. Hopefully we can have the code be a little more understandable and easy, uh, easier to repurpose into other people's projects. So um, I started my attempt at that. I've been making a few widgets to try to make it easier to do that uh, with this goal in mind. Um, and so I finally have gotten enough of them knocked out that I have started on the actual project. And then uh, ultimately I hope to create a async IO version as well. So we can have a place to point folks who want to do uh, user interfaces with async IO. Um, I uh, put in uh, this weekend a, a pair of PRs into Blinka Display.io uh, to bring a couple APIs in line with some of the newer features that were added to the core. Um, up in, upcoming this week, um, I will, let's see, complete, I would like to complete the remaining touch-ups on the last few PRs that were submitted during uh, PyCon, and I got a few of those knocked out this morning. I think there's maybe one or two left, so I'll be doing those this afternoon. Um, I will be testing and reviewing that tab layout uh, example from Paul SK. I noticed uh, something this weekend where uh, Blinka Display.io uh, doesn't want to show bitmap labels, so I intend to look into that a bit and figure out what's going on there. And then um, the last thing I have is to uh, try to wrap up the testing around the uh, hidden vector uh, IO, vector IO shapes uh, and make any remaining adjustments. I have a PR open for that, but I just need to circle back and see uh, what's left to do on that one. So I hope to wrap that up this week. Um, and that is it for my status updates. So next up, I will send it over to Dan. Okay, thank you. Um, so as mentioned, I released uh, CircuitPython 7 for your release candidate zero um, yesterday. Uh, we know of one possible fix for the monster mask board, um, but uh, other than that, we hope that we can turn this into 7.3.0 final suit. Um, there are some ongoing issues on ESP32 S3 with I2C. Uh, there are a number of different bugs in the Espressif ESP IDF repo. Um, I, we were having trouble with the um, fuel gauge, the battery gauge, uh, that's on the S3 uh, feather seems to, it does a lot of clock stretching, and it seems like ESP32 S3 has trouble with that. So I managed to recreate this problem in a simple example in ESP IDF, and I've submitted that to an existing bug, which is basically the same thing in the ESP IDF repo. And uh, I think hopefully we'll get the attention of the person who's been working on I2C bugs, and it will be fixed. Okay, and then uh, continuing this week, I will uh, circle back to working on some Wi-Fi issues, problems that have been come up with um, requests and or the matrix portal library where things just crash. And also I'll continue working on the port testing library that I'm working on to sort of which vets that a port to a particular family of chips is working properly. And once we finish 730 final, we've still got you know, almost a couple dozen bugs in the 7xx milestone that we should work on before we finish this or else we start working on the Minato. I don't know. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks, Dan. Uh, next up is Jeff, who is not present today, so I'll read. Uh, Jeff writes, last week um, he worked on, uh, let's see, finished up enhancements to the PIO guide. Uh, also published the Adafruit CircuitPython floppy library into the bundle and read the docs. And then for this week, uh, Jeff is in Paris, France. Um, so that definitely sounds like a lot of fun. 
Um, next up, welcome back, and I will pass it over to uh, Jerry. There's that button. Um, hi, thanks. Um, oops, that didn't work. Um, I was going to try and post a picture, but it may not work. Um, so yeah, I just got back from 10 days without internet, and boy, was was that an exceptional. <laughs> nice break. Um, and um, I just wanted to give folks a heads up that going forward, I'm going to be greatly reducing my presence both here on Discord, particularly here on Discord, and, and in the forums. Um, oops. Let me do, reduce the cat presence to it. Yeah. Um, yeah, during this this trip, I had a lot of time to reflect on my life's priorities, and uh, and I there are some things I just need to focus my attention on, and other than than what I've I've been doing in terms of uh, hanging around <laughs> on the on the chats a lot, and um, I'll be around. I'll be an active user of Circuit Python, and but I'll just be devoting a lot less time to Discord and the forums. So uh, and I'll probably you know not be attending these meetings regularly. But I will will be around and um, available. You know, if anyone needs to reach out, feel feel free. This is a great community, and I I really appreciate all all that's given to me. So, um, um, like I said, not going away, just uh, backing off quite a bit. Thanks. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Jerry. Um, next up, I will pass it over to Katney. Hello. So last week, I taught Liz how to make fritzing objects, which is a pretty big deal because it's a very involved process at times. And she picked it up immediately, and that was excellent. I proofed her first fritzing that she did on her own, which was very well done. I started and am probably 75% through the file library file types guide page. Uh, I finished all my guide feedback that had been backed up for quite a while. And I tested PyLeap for PyLeap and for CircuitPython updates. This week, I uh, plan to finish up the library file types guide page. I'll be doing a new guide on documenting how to add a new project to PyLeap, continue testing PyLeap, uh, pick arbitrary fritzing objects from older products for Liz to create, um, just to make sure she's solid on the process and that um, to give her a little bit of practice because uh, we don't need any new ones right now. So um, her, if, if we stuck to only those, her practice would be limited to uh, when we actually have new ones. Um, and then uh, we found some tool, or PT found some tools uh, to help make your GitHub profile excellent uh, using Markdown and other things. And so I'm going to be doing a short guide on that as well it sounds like um and then also we're moving i didn't add this to my notes it's in my other notes um we have a guy that has every i squared c address well not all not every but has a bunch of i squared c addresses for a bunch of different boards and we get a lot of people requesting um us to add a bunch of boards and so what we're gonna try to do is have the, the actual address lists live as a GitHub repository and then use the Markdown embed feature in Learn to actually embed those in and then people can just do PRs to add their um, requested I squared C address. Um, I will be doing the beginning part of that, but then uh, I might tag a couple people in to, um, to help out with that if they're interested, but that is not a super high priority. And that's what I've got. All right. Thanks, Katney. Um, next up, I will pass it over to Maker Melissa. Uh, hold on just a second. I lost the Git or the document here. No worries. Uh, okay. So uh, last week, I worked on, I wrote a guide using RuneStone to edit CircuitPython on, or code on iOS devices. I worked on the 2.7 inch e ink guide, which will be the last revamped guide. And uh, this week I'm going to finish up the e ink guide and then I'll deprecate the more generalized e ink guide. 
and start working through uh, guide feedback for guides that I worked on, but weren't actually under my name. So um, that's it. All right. Thank you, Maker Melissa. Uh, next up, I will pass it over to Paul Cutler. Uh, last week, I finished editing three more podcast episodes, and I've got guests planned through the end of September and still more people to invite. So that's exciting, including a couple people in this meeting that I want to reach out to. So don't be surprised if you hear from me. And then um, I mentioned it earlier, but I completed a personal Pi Portal project that I've been working on off and on when I'm not working on the podcast. Um, when I hit a button on my website, it now sends an image directly to my Pi Portal automatically. Um, and that image is typically a, a covered art from a record album. So I'm a big music guy. So that made me very happy. That's all I got. Awesome. Thank you, Paul. Uh, next up is Tammy Makes Things, who is not attending, so I'll read hers. Uh, let's see, we didn't get anything uh, that she was hoping for done last week because of work and personal conflicts. Uh, but this week, uh, Tammy's hoping to get back to uh, regular live streams on Twitch.tv. There's a link in the notes if you'd like to follow Tammy on Twitch. Um, so uh, getting back to streams this week, working on the Display.io card deck library. Uh, trying to do a couple uh, more PR reviews and uh, getting, let's see, getting my uh, project list organized so I can be a bit more focused. All right, and uh, next up, I will send it over to Scott. Thank you, Tim. Uh, okay, so last week was my first week back after six weeks off for paternity leave. <laughs> uh, since then, I've caught up on email and I gave up on catching up on the Discord chat, so... Uh, I've caught the last few days and I got over the weekend, but, um, like, I didn't go through six weeks of Discord chats. Um, the first, kind of one of the main things is the BLE workflow was broken, um, by the reload work that happened in 7.2. Uh, so I did two fixes for that this week, uh, and now we keep BLE active through the wait period that happens after the VM is done. Um, that's new. So what we used to do is with the old reload code, we would actually wait for subsequent writes while your code was still running. Uh, but Dan switched it uh, to be clearer where the very first time we think we're going to reload, we stop your code and then we wait after that. Um, you may have noticed that working with CircuitPython. I think it's a better change, but it did uh, break the BLE stuff because the BLE stuff, when the VM gets shut down, the BLE stuff gets reset. And that, that was a problem. So BLE now gets kind of reset twice, um, or at least in two stages. Um, so I think that's good, and thank you to Katni for testing it. Um, I'm working on switching the NTP library to actually using sockets to do NTP. Um, I should cross this, may need to change get time on ESP32 spy. I'm just going to not deal with that. So I've got some examples to change, um, and I'll do that, and Lamar is going to do the review for me. So. Uh, that should mean that we should be able to use NTP on the native sockets, which will be cool. And then on Friday, I I, I found this um, these ARM development studio files, which are used uh, to define properties of like ARM cores, um, and that includes some of the registers, like the SysTick registers. And these registers are not usually in the SVD files that vendors provide. Uh, but I found this uh, project that was doing conversion from these ADS XML files to SVDs. And uh, those registers are really handy, especially if you want to know like, what the active, active interrupt is and stuff. So I just hacked up a quick Python script that um, converts these ADS XML files to SVD files. So um, should be able to use existing tooling for SVDs to be able to look at the registers that are kind of common for a given uh, ARM Cortex core, which should be cool. Um, and I put a link there. And I was talking with the Pi OCD person a bit about uh, getting support in there as well. And there was like some XSLT file to do the transformation. I was like, I don't want to deal with that. So I just hacked it up in Python, um, which I enjoy doing. <laughs> uh, this week, uh, I got to wrap up the NTP library changes. I'm going to try to do that today. Um, and then I'm starting on the web workflow. Um, I did the MDNS stuff before my leave. Uh, the next thing up is kind of secrets management. Um, basically, where do we store Wi-Fi credentials so that both like user code and CircuitPython core code can access it? Um, I do think this is maybe something broadly we're going to want to do in terms of just like setting the behavior of CircuitPython over time. Um, 
so if you have opinions about this, please let me know. Not right, not immediately, but um, reach out to me if you have opinions about this. Um, one thing Lamore was talking about was being better about like obfuscating credentials, so they're not so easy to look at. But I th I think that's kind of a it's kind of a like if it's not super secure, maybe it's better that we just make it obvious it's not secure rather than trying to be a little secure. Um, anyway, the thing that I'm thinking about is there's a, a .env library um, which stores credentials for regular Python projects in a .env file. And I think I want to try to mimic that with uh, CircuitPython. So I'll just add a subset of that library that we need. And then we'll also have access to some C functions that can read and write that file. Um, so that the core can say, like, hey, get me this key out of this file. And if it's there, then it can, like, automatically connect to Wi-Fi and, and keep that connection consistent and stuff like that. So uh, that's the direction I'm going, web workflow, which could be really exciting. So uh, if you have thoughts and stuff, uh, please reach out to me. All right. Thanks, Scott. Definitely exciting stuff. Um, next up is Tectric, who is text only. So I will take a timestamp and then read. Uh, last week, last week Tectric uh, wrote and deployed a script for patching the pre-commit config YAML file in all of the libraries in the bundle, as well as in the cookie cutter repo. Um, added more documentation to the core relating to linking to learn guides and other resources for modules. Uh, worked on making uh, MAX7219 BCD digits chainable. Uh, turned out to be harder than he had at, uh, thought at first, so it's still a work in project, uh, progress. Um, and then this week, Tectric writes, uh, learning to use Adabot with Catney. Uh, many more infrastructure files need to be patched across the library, so going to try to plan that out to start writing scripts if Adabot can't do it. Um, still working on refactoring the uh, ATECC library. Had a small hiccup while, uh, excuse me, had a small hiccup receiving the wrong part. Uh, looking at writing a data class like or adders like library for adding similar out of the box functionality to classes uh, via decorators and fields. Uh, and then maybe the following week, looking at the Adafruit logging differences from CPython logging to see if moving some things around would be more helpful. Uh, thanks to Ask Patrick W for offering help to test. Uh, and then next up, I will send it over to TG Techie. Thank you. And before I get on to uh, my updates, uh, congratulations, Scott. Um, and Dan, if if that is the same battery gauge chip that is on the Adafruit's fuel gauge board, um, doesn't the NRF have some trouble with that as well? No, um, it doesn't have trouble. So let's. I don't oh, think. So. Okay. It's it's, it's, I've it's had a some... problem with the S three. Yeah. Okay. Maybe it has different trouble, or maybe I'm not nice to my circuit boards. Um, okay. Thank you. So uh, I've been um, moving on to my SAS updates. I've, I've been away quite a while. Um, I, I think it's about a year. Excuse me. Um, so, but uh, short version highlights. Um, I, I'm on break from college. And I was from college you were finally getting to write C code in the computer engineering program for the first time in junior year, which doesn't make a lot of sense, but was a lot of fun. Um, and uh, learning how to study, which was interesting. Um, <clears throat> otherwise, I've also uh, I tried typed Python and fell absolutely in love with in love with it because um, it makes I find it makes my life programming a lot easier. And I'm sure other people love it for other reasons as well. Um, I also helped a senior design project at, at the school run CircuitPython on one of their boards, uh, Metro, uh, at 7051, but they forgot to add Flash to it, so we had to 
fiddle around with stuff to see if we could get to use the internal file system. And it, it took some hacking, but um, we were able to shrink the interpreter side enough down where we could fit it in three fourths of the flash, uh, if I'm remembering the ratio correctly. Just a lot of fun. Um, last week, I had an opportunity to spend days doing whatever I wanted. So of course I came back to CircuitPython. Um, and I've been, for years now, uh, working on a, uh, making an easy to use graphics framework for Python and CircuitPython um, to touch backend ETC. Uh, the idea being I, I wanted to be easy to use. But um, while I was doing that, I've been writing typed code and it was generic. And I have been having trouble getting the generic code to run on both the CircuitPython interpreter and the CPython interpreter without like adding decorators and very carefully using specific classes that sometimes aren't actually classes if they're running in CircuitPython, et cetera. So um, having more experience with things, I branched CircuitPython and added one, one specific function uh, and to add uh, under class get item support. I have thoughts on how to do it efficiently, and et cetera, and I think it's a larger discussion. Whether or not it should even work, but that's what I did do last week, and it was a lot of fun. Um, and finding the MP type type object was also a lot of fun. It's really cool. Um, next week, I have uh, more more of the same uh, that and finishing up a class. Um, I have sort of two two quick questions. Oh, maybe three. Um, and if they are, are grow past a little bit, as, as you said, I'm totally around to uh, talk about them in the weeds. Um, for PRs regarding documentation, is it like is there a suggestion for grouping related and unrelated? Or like is it fine to have a bunch of smaller PRs if it's improving the description to a function or something? Um, I will let other folks chime up if they have ideas as well. I would say, uh, personally, I don't see any issue with small PRs. Um, so yeah, I would say if you spot something that you can take care of and are compelled to do so, go ahead and make a PR for it. It doesn't matter if it's just a small thing. Um, yeah, that's that's my view on it. Uh, awesome, thank you. Um, I did some Googling around. Is there, and uh, something came up when I accidentally submitted a PR for something else. But, uh, act, uh, accidentally, way preemptively. Um, is there a specific version of the typing library CircuitPython targets or supports, or is that just up in the air? Um. Oh, I see some people typing. <laughs> Yeah, I think the short answer is it is up in the air a little bit. I would say the thing that we are pinned to most directly right now is um, in like the Blinka libraries, they currently, and I think it's set for 3.7. I would have to go look at one of them to be sure. But I think like setup pi inside of the uh, Blinka libraries is pinned to a version of Python. And so that's kind of the thing that we're most directly tied to. I think that that was updated when we first started adding typing into the Blinka uh, layer of libraries, but I'm not 100% sure if that's when we did it specifically. Um, but I would say also, I think we kind of updated it to just the lowest one at the time that kind of had everything we needed. Um, not necessarily chose it because it supported all of the exact things that we were planning on doing or, or using. So it's certainly likely that it will get updated in the future to point to one of the newer ones, which definitely do have lots of uh, helpful things for typing. Okay, uh, thank okay. you. And I'm assuming type extensions are allowed. Using the type extensions module is fine. Um, but, but I can search for that uh, outside of meeting. Yeah. So, uh, for those you, on you audio, typing uh, extensions for three six in some cases, if 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 okay. it's not there, but we try to avoid try to get people to use at least three seven. Um. 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, lastly, after coming back from, from the long hiatus, um, a bunch of like the tooling around CircuitPython has improved a lot, which has been a lot of fun to see. Um, I noticed while well, learning how to use pre-commit ish, um, I ran it on the whole CircuitPython repo and it reformatted 30 plus files. I, I don't know if that is intentional. I have noticed that as well. I also don't know if it's intentional. My understanding of what has happened is that lots of people, and I think even the guides tell you to do it this way, um, people run with pre-commit install. So, so like pre-commit installed into the repo to make it automatically run whenever you actually do make a commit. And I think when you do it that way, it uh, it only runs against files that are actually in the commit. So in that case, it only runs against the files that you changed. But if you run like pre-commit uh, run dash A or pre-commit run all, uh, which I do a lot of times on libraries, if you run that command in the core, I have noticed as well that it does um, reformat a bunch of like uh, Python code that's in various places in the core. Um, so I would... Definitely defer to maybe uh, Scott or, or Dan or anybody, if anybody knows about those files or if we want to just make that change and merge it to main. Uh, but it's definitely, I have seen what you are talking about, I think. No, the, those files come from MicroPython and they don't use the same rules. So we don't, gotcha. for merging reasons, we'd rather not change them from the upstream. I see. I wonder, yeah. uh, it may be worth looking into, I don't, I'm not super familiar with pre-commit configs. I wonder if there's a way to um, lock like those. Them. I guess black though, black really wants to do everything. Maybe not. But yeah, so that's, mm -hmm. uh, that's what we got there. It is, it is known and it is uh, intended to be that way. So yeah, your, your options, uh, oh, go ahead. Some of these files are not from MicroPython. Oh. Um, my reaction is that I get some differences sometimes if I'm using different versions, but I would just actually make a PR because um, that will run it on uh, the CI, and that that will the CI may say like, oh, some of these are wrong <laughs> uh, if the versions are mismatched. Uh, otherwise, I would say we we could do them. Um, generally, I don't have a tr trouble. I don't think we should have trouble with formatting issues when merging MicroPython because we could always run the pre-commit stuff on MicroPython before we merge it in uh, to minimize that as well. That's, that's a good point, yeah. Like, that's the whole I mean, I, idea with formatting. Yeah. But we sh I thought uh, we were set up to be the same as MicroPython. I thought we chose to do that. I, I, when you say they didn't, you mean they come from third-party libraries that micro from that are I mean, th in this change, there's some stuff in, like, ports at Mel. Um, oh. There is some stuff. It's in going into submodules, right? It's not. It's not going oh, into okay. submodules. Yeah, you, well, get, that, you wouldn't get a diff on CircuitPython, then. Yeah. Well, just right. I would. I would say this. Yeah, I would. We can. We can. You can pursue the individual things and try a PR. Yeah, okay. I, would, I would make a PR on it just to see if the CI agrees with you, because I do have versioning issues also... with the tools. I wouldn't be surprised if it's a we have incompatible crust uncrustify versions. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I actually have. I've been having this, to downgrade mine. Ah, is there a way? Where, or do you know what version that you have to downgrade to? I'm downgrading to zero seven one. I think. I'm gonna write that down, and or make a PR to put that. Oh somewhere. no, I That's have okay. zero point seventy four point zero. That might actually be too new. <laughs> zero. I think I did up your little Hold on. Zero. But you think it should be 72. It should be 72. Zero, 072.0. Zero. I, have, I have the downgrade command that I've had to run. The, the CI will test it. We'll catch it. Because um, the CI will disagree with you. Basically, what you need to do is you need to match the version in Ubuntu of Uncrustify. Okay. Uh, but I'm not under yeah. that, so I get the newer one faster. Software. Love it and, and not love it sometimes, right? I feel you. Um, 
But it means that I find out all these things early. <laughs> um, thank you. Mm-hmm. All right. Thanks. Welcome that's... back. Great to be back. Yep. All right. So uh, next up in our final section for today is In the Weeds. And uh, again, uh, to reiterate, In the Weeds, this is an opportunity for more long-form discussions that could either come out of status updates or they can be topics that folks have identified ahead of time and put in the note stock. If you have any in the weeds topic, uh, please be sure to add them down at the bottom of the notes doc, and we will just go through them in the order that they uh, are in there. Uh, so first uh, in the, oh, let me uh, take a timestamp actually in the weeds, and then our first uh, in the weeds is actually uh, also from TG Techie. So why don't you uh, tell us what we are going to talk about here, TG? Hi. Uh, so I have two. Two in the weeds topics in here, but maybe the second one should go at the end. Okay. Not sure. Uh, first one, uh, as I mentioned before, I accidentally submitted a PR a little too early before actually adding proper content. Um, but it it brought up a um, discussion about uh, optimizing for um, the type checking variable in the type module. So Python has a, in the typing module a predefined variable that looks like it's true to the typing uh, system and type checker, but it will always be false at runtime. Um, and it, there was a discussion between um, Jeff and Dan about optimizing around that. I be believe this, it settled on using the try accept syntax. Uh, I have a link in the meeting notes if someone wants to see their discussion. Um, and before I go into thin the weeds, I was curious. I, um, the circuit Python optimizer can optimize around failed try imports, uh, uh, imports inside of try statements for frozen modules. Is that true? I had trouble it looking does at the not source optimize. to figure out. The, the, the issue is more that. It doesn't, during the, it compiles all that code. So it takes up space in the MPY file. So um, is that what you're asking? Yes. Oh, I, I should have asked that directly, shouldn't I? That's the point. The point is that, like, I had originally said, oh, could we just put it inside try accept? And Jeff said, well, but then it wouldn't get optimized away, where, because it's not, a constant optimization. It's an opt optimization that's dependent on a constant. So, um, yeah. whereas if you use an if statement, it's dependent on a constant, and it can say, I'm just not going to include this code because it's always false. Okay. So, that's why um, to do it that way. So, but uh, the... Okay. Is there interest in trying to reduce that MPy compiled? Size? Yeah, because we have, because like the Circuit Playground Express library is very tight. So um, if it has type there, checking in it, we want to not, to include as little of that type checking as possible in that final library. Um, so I, I want to, before I, so my thought was, does, is there a need for a separate facility that performs the same thing, but is provided by CircuitPython and so not I, I saw what you're saying here, and I, I'm not sure it's going to work because we also wanted this to work under regular CPython. And so my Pi, for instance, knows about type checking, all caps type checking. It doesn't know anything about MicroPython, and micro, my, my Pi is not going to do the right thing. Um, it's I, on a particular annotation. So I, I mean, believe on... you can. Uh, there's a there's a Python typing thing called literal, where you can say something is like always literally true, pun not intended. Uh, I believe my Py can see that and will interpret another variable as always true. Maybe, maybe um, that would work, but that was that would be the thing is that we, the idea was. To make this code be as compatible as possible with the current C Python okay. mechanisms, so that's what so I like would say. running it without Blinka. Yeah, if you don't run it with Blinka, then you 
because Blicka is going to have to provide the mechanism. So, or you're going to have because Blinka is Blinka maybe with this literal truth thing, but I was going to say like you know, Blinka yeah Blinka could define that thing, but it's not necessarily going to solve the problem. So, um, so which which problem? The problem that whether my pie knows what the value is or not, what, what meaning of it. So okay, um, if it if it did, would there be interest in using that as a way to? Basically, mm -hmm. I, I think if that works, I think there's a way where we can like just add a add a add that constant circuit Python, and then my pie will see it as if it's type checking. Clearly, should have practiced my explanation for this. Uh, I didn't. Sorry, it's a little jar jarbled. Um, so, so I would say break this up as an issue or as a pull request, and and I think we'll talk about it. I think that's probably the okay. And, and see how it works out. I think that would be yeah, that's fine. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Um, and the next one is is kind of a like relating to typing, except it would be a adding a feature one one function. I don't know if it's best to discuss this discuss this now, and maybe it should just be uh, Jay. Please put it in a PR. But, so is um, it? We already are using proto. We have this library circuit Python underscore typing, and it's using it provides protocol things already. Are you asking about adding it in the the circuit Python core? Um. Because right now, MicroPython uh, just ignores all annotations, OK? It doesn't do actually do yes. anything with the annotations. It just throws them away. And, and so there's no, the only support for annotations is in the sense that if we run through something through MyPy, it might notice, or um, you know, IDEs, might, it might help IDEs. But MicroPython itself, and we use that core, doesn't do anything with annotations. It just throws them away. Yes. Uh, um, I, and I, sorry. I, I think there's, or what I found is there's two, um, if it has support for uh, defining protocols. I believe there's two, maybe just one, um, things that you can't put in type annotations that the typing module needs. Uh, for like a generic class, being the type bars and the uh, generic open bracket, close bracket. So you're saying that it's is... not supporting. But it, it can't because um, I might have an image. Andy. When you define a generic class, like something that contains something else, you want to type it, you, that code has to run a little bit, even though it ends up not doing anything. If we were to support that, the syntax requires it just at runtime a little. I, I think we have libraries that are already using this notation, and they're 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 compiling. Okay. So, like, um, there, there, if you look, if you look in the Circuit Python typing repo, there are some things that are defined with protocol, and they're used in some like libraries, like in some of the BLE libraries or. Wi-Fi libraries, I can't remember which. They're so, running on CircuitPython? Yeah. Yeah, they definitely do. I, the, the protocols that are used in that typing library definitely do work on CircuitPython. I've tested them. Yeah, and, and so MicroPython just throws away protocol open square bracket something, close square bracket. Oh. Just like at a syntactic level? Yeah, that's what I'm telling you. MicroPython doesn't do anything with annotations. It's, oh, oh. It can, annotations, including the annotations. ones that aren't. Oh, I thought, ah, I, mis, I misinterpreted that, that description then. Uh, I know I've asked this question ages ago. It doesn't. I thought it was only for like the you. colon and arrow. Why would that you put them in the syntax? It doesn't do anything with them. OK. So, OK, OK. I, I did not realize that the parentheses in the class list were included there. I yeah. must have missed that when, when I was testing. Yeah. Uh, super cool. I would say uh, take, thank thank take, you. Take a look around uh, some of the libraries. It's been more a lot of more recent stuff, honestly, since about like um, 
like Hacktoberfest was kind of our first uh, dive in, but also we've done a lot of more work recently with PyCon sprints and stuff. But if you take a look around some recent PRs uh, across the libraries, um, there's lots of new typing stuff. So you can see kind of what uh, what types of things we have done and what types of things do uh, do work today. Yeah, so Tectric is doing a lot of this work. And if you just, if you like clone the bundle repo and get all the submodules, you can grep through all the libraries and find uses of protocol. Get grip. Okay. Uh, yeah. Will do. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Uh, thanks, TG Techie. Um, next up in the weeds topic is from uh, Tom, A I O U E. Uh, attending but can't talk, so I'll read this one. Um, let's see, yeah, no, this is definitely the right place to talk about it. So Tom says, uh, Pi portals are amazing devices, great screens, Wi-Fi speaker, sensors, micro SD slot, and more all built in. They deserve to be more popular. Uh, to support this, uh, I've created an issue on CircuitPython org uh, GitHub, which I will, let's see, try to copy this and paste in the chat for us. Um, so that's on CircuitPython org, the website, circuitpython.org. Um, the proposal uh, that Tom has is simply adding tag categories for Pi portals to the Learn site, just like the Circuit Playground and its variants have. Uh, I believe this would make the Pi portals more uh, popular and approachable, as they'd be easier to discover and learn about. Um, and I think this page is this the page that lists a bunch of projects for that device. So and we have something called groups. Maybe Katni wants to say something about that in, in the learn in learn guides. My overall thought on this is that this is not the place that can make that decision. Um, but just because when, once you get into stuff that's actually going into learn, there are other people who need to be part of that decision who don't attend this meeting. Um, we do have groups. Uh, that are not currently super prominent, I think, still, but they're they're working on that, um, which is where you can make a set of a, a set or a list of um, related projects, and then they all sort of show up in one place. Um, as for adding categories to learn, that's definitely outside of of a decision we can make here. Um, the issue I, I read through it earlier. It's it's very thorough. Um, I can definitely pass it on to the right folks, but I make no guarantees as to whether or not um, it'll get integrated. But and and unfortunately, like I, I I greatly appreciate the issue, but there's there's really no way for you to help with this <laughs> other than the issue, which which was excellent. Um, but Learn, learn is a proprietary system, and unless you are, you know, part of it as an as a an author or, um, you know, technical contributor or whatever, um, you can't really make changes to the learn system, um, which is where this would have to go. So, uh, I just want to let you know now, um, there's not really a whole lot you can do beyond, um, what you've already done for us. But there's there's a couple I think small solutions which is like at creating a Pi Portal group, um, which I actually suppose on some level you could help with if you wanted to pick a you know seven projects or something Pi Portal related that you think sort of embody the Pi Portal as a product. Um, that would make making the group easier. Um, There is a list, it looks like, um, I, I don't know exactly the right uh, terminology for it, but I just posted the link for it, but product slash and then product ID and then slash guides. This basically gives you a page that is really almost the exact same kind of content that was on that Circuit Playground page. Yeah. Um, which it has I think basically it's... overview of the device and then a list of all of the uh, relevant guides. I think the issue is that it doesn't um it's not it's not necessarily that easy to find. That's true. Yeah, I happen like, to know where it was linked from and that's Yeah, reason. like you you to... you knew the link exactly yeah. and like other folks don't necessarily know that link or know to know to click on it. Um so making something like this more prominent might be useful. Um but 
also if you look at um the explore and learn um i see what you're saying okay i think you're requesting something different than i think you are and that's that's where the disconnect is um, I think I think there's kind of two places I can think of. Like the issues on circuitpython.org is really good for the categorization of boards. Mm -hmm. um, but when thinking of learn stuff, I think support at adafruit.com is a way to support it. Apparently because... they tried that. Oh, okay. Because some of that stuff gets forwarded on to the internal teams. Right. And, and like you said, Katni, like unfortunately it's kind of like pretty closed learn is still pretty close yeah so i can at least bring the issue to the attention of you know a couple folks um but like i said i, I can't make any guarantees so i just i want to make sure the expectations are accurate all right yeah thanks kenny i uh, appreciate your input definitely um Next up is, let's see, a topic from Tectric, who is text only. So I'll uh, read it, this one out. I was kind of involved in the PR as well. Um, the specific PR here, I'll link it. It's this EMC 2101 fan driver. I think the um, topic is a little bit more general than the specific PR. Basically, uh, the gist of it is the driver, this fan driver has support for uh, different levels of functionality, like for instance, you can use a fan with a tachometer pin, which uh, tells the driver how fast the fan is moving. Um, but you can also use the same driver without a tachometer pin. Um, but the uh, the actual chip that's on board has like a status uh, register. And um, in this PR, the, the uh, author of it basically set it up to where it would pull the status register every time it tried to do some other action. Like if you uh, tried to set something or read some other register or something, it would also read the status register and then raise an exception if um, it was you know one of the values that indicates a problem, which if you're not using all the functionality, it would be uh, one of the problem ones. So the specific case here was like, you could use the fan driver uh, without the tachometer. Uh, the fans I have, because um, I did some testing on this, the fans I have don't even have a tachometer pin. Um, and in the current version of the library, I was able to hook them up and run the examples and stuff. And obviously it doesn't tell me the speed that it thinks the fan is running because it's not hooked up to it, um, but everything else was able to work fine. It was able to drive the fan as well as change the fans um, you know, speed, at least in that one way direction, right? It could tell it how fast to go. But I think kind of the general question is like philosophically in libraries, do we want um, do we want libraries to raise exceptions if the user is only using like part of the functionality um, essentially? Like if they don't care about the tachometer, um, do we still want to raise an exception because the status register says that something is wrong, or do we want to allow that library to be used um, you know to the best extent it can? given what is hooked up in it uh, in the way that the, the person is using it. And then if we do want it to be able to run, do we want to have like a strict mode or something that will actually enforce the status register and raise the exceptions? Um, and if so, like what do we want the API to that to look like? Just an argument in the constructor, uh, you know, tell it strict is true and then it will raise exceptions uh, if it finds errors in the status, or do we want to do like a subclass uh, of the main driver class or something like that that um, contains that functionality? I think that's the, the gist of it. Uh, Tectric, if you're around in text and you have anything to add, you can drop it in the, uh, the Discord there. My intuition is that we sh it just shouldn't raise an exception. OK. Um, I think that it's a trap to try to support everything with a particular driver, um, especially when we're doing driver development. We really do kind of want to do, hit the hit the main points of it, but not be exhaustive. Um, and checking status register and raising exceptions for everything sounds exhaustive to me. Okay. Uh, I think my my gut says that you don't really want to raise exceptions at all. What you really want is just a 
access to the status register that the user code can check, right? Like, okay. So we'll make sure, I don't recall in this case, if it is like a public method without an underscore, but if it is not, if it, if it does have a leading underscore, maybe we make that part of the public API by removing the, uh, the leading underscore and then um, user code could always pull that and do right, whatever if they, they care about that. Okay, yeah. I like that approach. Yeah, that's kind of what I feel like. Um... Okay. I see your I see what you're saying with the like otherwise I have to tell it whether I care about it or not. Right. Yeah. It's kind of weird. Yep. Okay. Um so I will um I can uh leave another an updated comment on that one and see where it's at and uh, make the necessary recommendations there. Uh so thank you. Yeah, feel free to at me on there too if you want me to chime in. Okay. Yeah, we'll do. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate your input and then um the last actual in the weeds uh, topic is yours, Scott. So uh, go ahead. Yeah. So just thinking about how we want to organize versions, um, like Dan did an RC zero for uh, seven three, which is what main is right now. Um, do we want to call main eight zero at this point because there are some pull requests that are waiting and we have issues open for eight zero as well? Um, the one confounding factor is that. MicroPython 119 is due pretty much any day, but I sh I'll check with them later and see if they have a better idea. Uh, but it will require a new version, a ma new major version, because it does have MPY changes. So, and of course, I don't know how quickly we'll want to adopt it as well. Um, so, so do we want to do 8.0 now, but know that if we adopt 119, we're going to need a 9? Um, I think that even if we don't do any official releases at 8.0, but then we merge in MicroPython, I think we should just switch to 9 uh, anyway, uh, just for clarity in terms of what uh, MPYs people should be using. Um, any thoughts? I, I, I don't think we should go to 8 yet. I don't see any reason to go okay. to 8 yet, um, because there's like not a theme or anything. Um, well, I mean, uh, there's two reasons to do it, right? One is a theme, and two is breaking stuff. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I there are all these there are all these right. Uh, uh, I I think what I'd say is like I I would I'm willing to continue on seven point X mm -hmm. until something happens where we need to break it. The only reason to go to eight O right now is because we keep on having to. Turn off one wire I.O. <laughs> you know, that's like the only reason. Yeah. There are a couple of other things that yeah. um so I, I I what I what I feel like is like 119 will come out. Right. You can probably wait a couple of weeks. I mean we can start merging it and have an 80 alpha. You know, yeah. at that point. But and then there'll probably be some bugs which they'll probably have to fix. And we can incorporate those. But the major, the, the, the jarring thing, which is the MPY format, is I think we should wait for that because yeah. otherwise it's kind of a support problem. Yeah. Um, that's fine with me. I, yeah. I might also introduce some incompatibilities with the web workflow stuff I'm doing. I'm not entirely sure. Um, at least, you know, I want to change it so that in particular cases, sockets and like the web the wi-fi connection itself will be maintained across resets which is not something that happens right now yeah and so so right so the problem is if you do that before we do the 119 merge right so, yeah but i'm not i'm not entirely sure that's the case because it's likely because i know naradoc already kind of said like well i like how it is now where i can manage when it's on yeah um, I think it's more likely that, like, I introduce this .env stuff, and then if there's a flag in there, then it works this other way. Mm -hmm. And that would be backwards compatible. So that would be okay. Um, hey, Scott? Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I was saying, I was wondering, you don't want, if you, if you have a jarring change like the MPY, why? I think that Regardless of anything else, that is actually actually the actual massive change that should cause a major version change. Yeah, I agree with you there. Oh yeah, we always do that. We always do that. Yeah, 
because if you don't wait for that, if you don't wait for that, I can see a problem with the uh, with the library bundles being all sideways. Well, I mean, it's just a matter of whether we do eight now and then nine later, or oh. we just wait for eight. Yeah, there which was I think one is what Dan's advocating for. There was one time I think when we made an MPY change while we were in alpha, and that's what you're trying to avoid, right? Is that what you're saying? It just ma- yeah, it makes no it makes no sense to do that. Yeah, like, numbers yeah. are free. So I think I think I think just to get some information from. Damien is probably great to say, like, how imminent is this? So, yeah, I'll bug Jim later. Yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't have chats with Damien, but Jim's on yeah, well, that's Jim, a good idea. Jim will, Jim will reply to me on Discord if I bug him. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I can double check. I, I've heard that it's imminent, so it shouldn't be that I mean, long. It, yeah, they were trying to do it on a, a TikTok schedule, but. I think that yeah. they're behind a little bit. So yeah, and I don't know. I don't know how hard it will be for us to integrate either. So that's the other question. Yeah, um, and whether it's actually worth it. <laughs> I don't know what else is in one nineteen besides the MPY mm-hmm. stuff because I don't think we're going to benefit from the MPY stuff ourselves. Uh, yeah, because of its prerequisites. It's just that the format will change, right? I mean, the, yeah. like, it's changing the optical format or something, right? So yeah. yeah. Or yeah, he's changing it so it can live in yeah. linear flash memory. Yeah. Which is cool. You just want to be... I just... You know, I, I, I would be deathly... Appra- I think I think when you said 8, eight and then when you decide whether or not the MPY is good, then go to 9. Or you you have to... When you decide... The, about the MPY, you're going to have to make a major version change. Right. No matter whether you do it at 8 or 9. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I th- I, so I think it's fine. I think, I think what we'll do is we'll just wait for 119, and then we'll do 8. Uh, mm-hmm. Because nothing is blocked on the new version. Well, there's PRs that are blocked on the new version, but that's okay. Um, they're not critical. All right. Sounds All right. Like... I'll add that to the notes. Yeah. Thanks, Scott. Uh, sounds like we got the plan forward for now. Um, so that was our last in the weeds uh, topic. So doing a wrap up for the meeting here. This has been the Circuit Python Weekly Meeting for May the sixteenth. Thank you to everyone who participated. Uh, if you want to support Adafruit and Circuit Python, as well as those of us that work on Circuit Python, consider purchasing hardware from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. The video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit. Uh, the podcast will be made available on major podcast services. Uh, it will also get featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Uh, visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe to that. The next meeting is scheduled to be held on Monday as usual. That's going to be May the 23rd, I believe, at 2 p.m. Eastern, the standard time. Um, Let's see. This meeting uh, will be held in the same place on the Adafruit Discord, which you can join at adafru.it slash discord. If you want to get notified about the meeting or any changes to the day or time, you can ask to be added to the CircuitPythonistas role on Discord, and then we'll ping you through there. Uh, if the time is going to be changing. Um, So that does it for this week's meeting. Thank you again to everyone who participated, and we hope to see you all next week. Thanks, everyone.